of our breakout groups. This morning we have David Miller from Coverseeds, who is going to talk to us about the rise of machines and how industrial equipment can join the supply chain. David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So, first off, what I want to know is, uh, can people actually hear me without me sticking a microphone on? Yes? I'm good. All right. Good. I don't like microphones. So, so yeah, it's the rise of the machine, right? And so, and really what we're going to be talking about here, and you guys know this probably better than anyone else, certainly in manufacturing, right? We're getting more and more automation, right? And these machines are more and more ever connected. And one of the things that we wanted to do in this presentation is really talk about where we're seeing that going. And I want to use some examples from some other industries. I've all, all, often thought uh, that, uh, that you know, copying is kind of the sheerest, sheerest form of, of, of flattery. And so, so this idea of kind of looking at what some other industries are, um, but I had to find, at least find one that was close to manufacturing. And so I'll, I'll be curious as to what you think of what we've had. So let's start with the, uh, who the heck is Cobison? And uh, I tell you, I love presenting uh, in Detroit because I, I do a lot of presentations around the country and around the world, and 95% of the time, this slide is hugely important because no one in the audience has any idea who we are, um, but you guys being uh, a lot from Southeast Michigan and suppliers, my guess is that some of you have heard of Cobison. People have heard of Cobison, right? <laughs> So we just to kind of go through, because you know, we're a little different than we used to be, right? Kind of born in the automotive industry. So I was the guy from General Motors uh, who was put on the Cobison team, along with folks from Ford, uh, Daimler Chrysler, uh, uh, and, and Renault, and Peugeot, and, and Nissan. And um, the idea at the time was this ability to connect uh, the OEMs to their suppliers. Um, originally, it was much less the EDI, although we do do some EDI now. Uh, what it really was is OEMs exposing more and more systems to suppliers where they were going to have to log in. And this idea of them being able to go to one spot, right? So Copuson still provides a supplier portal for the OEMs, one place to log in, one place to administer your user. Uh, in 2004, we were bought by CompuWare. You guys all remember CompuWare. They're not in existence anymore, but, but uh, they, when they bought us, they wanted us to move into other industries. And so, but we did that same thing, right? It was connecting large organizations to their external partners. So healthcare was the first place we moved. Physicians getting the data about patients that were other places. And that was our first move into kind of doing not quite machine to machine like EDI, but really moving into this whole idea of connecting to things, right? So it was connecting to systems like um, uh, like uh, blood pressure uh, 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 cups at uh, hospitals, right? Connecting to um, to insulin pumps that were implanted in patients, right? The ability to do monitoring of uh, 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 of uh, not just heart monitors uh, in hospitals, right, but implanted devices. And so we kind of got into this whole idea uh, of that, right? From there, uh, moved into some energy stuff. And then in the last four years, kind of back to automotive. And it's not that the OEMs don't uh, like their suppliers anymore, but they've decided that now they want to have connectivity to their owners. And so what it is, it's connected vehicle, right? And that's, it's kind of an internet of things, right? And this is kind of where we see things going. And I'm going to talk a lot about what that internet of things really means. So lots of uh, global customers, right? Uh, uh, lots of things, uh, not just in uh, healthcare, but in energy industry, right? Uh, but automotive is still kind of at our heart, certainly moving back to the next vehicle, right? Lots of customers, lots of organizations, lots of identities. That's, this is gonna be kind of a theme, right? One of the things I just wanna talk about is this whole idea of how it is you connect is going to have a lot to do with identity management and, and hopefully I can get across why that is an important aspect, right? Part of it is the security aspect of it, which I can also talk to, but a lot of it does have to do just with the fact of you do have to be able to identify the things that are connecting in your environment. So, Internet of Things, right? So I have done uh, a 
presentation like this at a bunch of conferences that are IoT conferences, right? Last year at CES, right? So uh, Consumer Electronics Show is actually becoming a huge automotive show. So the Automotive Hall at CES, right? Where if you really think about it, they actually are looking at vehicles as a consumer electronic sort of, sort of thing. And everyone has this slide, right? This is called the billions and billions slide, right? And this is the slide where basically what you do is you say, look, there used to be very, very few things, right? And now we're going to talk about, right, you know, we're talking about 50 billion plus. But if we think about what we're seeing in the industry, everybody here probably can kind of experience this, right? Those of you who have been around long enough know that in the beginning, the only connected thing that I had was my desktop computer, right? So, so laptops were even new. The idea of having two computers was new. So, so people maybe had one thing that was connected. It was their computer that was connected, and it was a very big outbound connection, right? If you remember in the beginning, right, of the internet, I would sit at my computer and I would outbound, right? Now what I have is more and more and more things connected. My vehicle is connected, but it's both inbound and outbound. So when I'm in my car, it communicates externally, Right? But when I'm outside of my car, I can do things like start my car remotely, right? So it's an inbound sort of, th a controlled sort of thing. If you take a look at a lot of security systems, if you take a look at HVAC systems, if you take a look at those things, right? Every one of these, right? All of these sensors and all that are things that are basically now more and more connected and are autonomous, right? They connect all by themselves, right? And they decide what it is they can and can't manage. Right? And so we're seeing that more and more in manufacturing also. So it used to be that the, that, the, that the robots, the assembly lines, the inventory management, the inventory systems, right, were very much of an outbound sort of thing, right? You would connect to them, they would tell you things about inventory. Now it's kind of this two-way sort of connectivity, right, where you know exactly where the truck is, where your inventory is, right? So, and that's because you have sensors and everything. So. We're seeing more and more of these sort of connected technologies. And if you look at it, it has changed, right, a little different than what I have seen in the past with a lot of high-tech technology. So if you think of in the past, in the past, computers really started in business and in governments, right, and in military, and then moved the application into people's homes. Connected things actually is much, much more a consumer-based sort of, sort of thing, right? Nest thermostats, those sorts of connected outside, and is, no, is now being embraced internally by large organizations. So <clears throat> 10 years ago, you never would have thought of the idea of actually controlling your plant HVAC system or your, or your plant floor system from the internet, right? It would all be internal. And so, but now that is getting more and more connectivity. So there's more and more connectivity that, that we're seeing, and it's now more about systems, right? And it's about networked industries. So now what it is, is my, my manufacturing base is no longer, right? I'm no longer the master of my own domain in manufacturing. So if you really think about it, um, when I started in automotive in 83, that was the uh, years of Roger Smith, General Motors, if you guys remember that. And Roger Smith's idea was GM is going to do everything, right? So steal the wheels, right, was kind of the, 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 the model at the time. Uh, we are going to own all of our suppliers, right? We're gonna have the Allied Supplier Group, right? We're going to build all of our own sub-assemblies. We're gonna manufacture our own parts. We're gonna buy our own IT company right, uh, in EDS, and we're going to do all of this internally, right? Um, since then, we've gone the exact opposite way, right, this whole idea of deconstructing the enterprise. And so now the way it works is, is I may not even own my factory floor. There are, uh, there are organizations out there that outsource the assembly of the vehicles, right, or of the sub-assemblies to third parties, right? They just do the engineering work. Right? You have lots of complete assemblies that end up coming in, right? At the same time, we have a lot of just-in-time sort of stuff. So what ends up happening is I have sub-assemblies that are basically coming in, and they have to come in exactly at the time that they are consumed because I want to keep inventory levels down. So 
on the one hand, I am pushing information out more, and I'm pushing responsibility out to third parties, but I'm making it so that they all have to be able to work basically in a re-aggregation, which now means I need to exactly be able to do a pull signal, for example, to a supplier, and by the way, I have to be able to keep into account exactly how long it takes that supplier to be able to ship that part. So it may be that the pull signal comes before I've even started the assembly process, because the shipping is going to take two weeks, but it only takes me six days to actually do the manufacturing, so I pull two weeks beforehand, knowing exactly when the shipping is, so that when, for example, the engine that goes in the Corvette that's uh, actually made uh, outside of the United States actually joins in at exactly the right time uh, uh, associated right when, that, when that's being built. So, so this is kind of some of the things that we're seeing in that. So if we look at this thing, right, so, you know, as I said, right, 70% of U.S. factories are more than 20 years old, right? Technical skills are more and more, right? So it's a lot of this STEM stuff, right? So, right, um, um, uh, which is a lot of science and technology uh, uh, sort of things, right? And the expectations are changing for the customers, at least, that we see. So customer expectation is when I buy a new connected device, right, when I buy this machine that is connected, I need it to be easy. So I need to make it so that it connects <clears throat> directly and it connects automatically. So again, we've seen this in the PC world. It used to be, right, if you're connecting up, for example, your television system, I remember the days where what you ended up having to do is run all the wires and it was the, you know, it was uh, either composite or component and I had connected in, I had to get the stereo system connected and do all of that. Now you have things like Sonos. I don't know if anybody here has ever seen a Sonos speaker system. You turn it on, it finds your Wi-Fi, it can pair directly with your television, you don't do anything at all, right? That's, that's what we want. We want the ability to bring these things in, turn them on, and have them be able to discover automatically what they need to connect to, right? It has to be instant service. So the idea of be, having to either retool something and say it's gonna take four weeks and it's gonna take a bunch of consultants to get things connected, nobody wants that, right? So it has to be almost instantaneous. It, it's gotta be relevant. So you have to be able to find use cases that actually make sense. Um, I'm convinced, at least at the, where the technology is today, for example, I'm not 100% positive, right, that these connected watches, right, so the Apple and Android are relevant. It's interesting that I have a watch that tells me that I have a phone call that's coming in, um, but in reality, it doesn't do a very good job as a watch, right? So there are lots of things we have out there that are cool, but are they truly relevant? Uh, anymore and in industry you have to find those things that are relevant and I want to go through a couple of use cases that I think are truly relevant use cases um, to be able to kind of give you guys an idea of where we see relevance in in manufacturing and in other industries right it has to make things easier not harder so if it doesn't remove hassles again I think the connected watch is a perfect example of this I'm again right I had one I stopped wearing it um, uh, I kind of went back to the Fitbit -y sort of thing and uh, the, uh, the problem was it added hassles. Every night you have to charge it. And honestly, I'm just not convinced when my phone rings that doing this is any easier than looking down at my phone. So, so in the end, it has to remove hassles and it has to add value. So, so in business, it has to be something that adds value. Uh, we propose that today, what you're getting now is it's unbelievably complex to set up. It takes forever to get it connected and to manage it. Right? It causes delays, so it takes a long time to be able to get the systems set up. Right? You have a very disconnected communication, so it's very, very difficult to be able to get it to, in a kind of connected world. There's more hassles, and in some cases, we kind of see the value being some of them. So, how do we kind of uh, uh, create this connectivity? And obviously, right, so, so, so us at Cobacent, we have a point of view. Right? And our point of view is this idea, basically, of an interoperability framework. Now, I know there's some folks here who uh, are, uh, uh, well, 
we used to call them EDI vans, but I don't think we call them EDI vans anymore because it's 2015 and we have to call them something different. Um, uh, which actually concerns me because I, I actually think the word van, right, which that stands for value added network, right, actually says a lot about what organizations do. Now, if you remember back uh, in the 80s, um, when EDI was becoming a fairly large deal with the OEMs, almost all the OEMs at the time managed all their own endpoints. I remember I worked at General Motors and I helped them basically connect all their suppliers. And the problem was that it was a 11 month project to get every single supplier on their version of EDI, right, their special version where they decided they had to do special things. And at the end of the 11 months, the standard had changed. So we spent another 11 months basically migrating each vendor to the, to the newest thing. Where Vans came up was this idea of a single place to connect. Why can't I connect to a third party and then they can manage and obfuscate from me all the different things that suppliers need to do, right? So protocol conversions and all that sort of thing. Imagine making that bigger. So instead of us talking about M to M, machine to machine connection, right? We're in the, in the beginning, right? It was a flat file or a comma delimited file sort of thing. And then we went to XML, right? That we've got, now we've gone to web services, right? Imagine also things like authentication, right? So now what it is, it's a modular API framework, right? That has a single place for a worker to be able to go to see everything that is connected, right? To understand all of the triggers that are associated, right? A single gateway for the plant to be able to connect to, as opposed to multiple, as opposed to managing a thousand or two thousand or five thousand VPNs, right, which is not unheard of, right, in large plant uh, uh, cases for each one of their suppliers, right, and then a simple place for third-party applications. So, so think about it. As we can do more and more connectivity for things related, again, to inventory management and logistics, there are two choices. One choice is the manufacturer is going to write their own code. They're going to Right? Which, by the way, I think the full folks at HP and uh, Deloitte and that would love for you to do is hire a lot of developers and we will write you a proprietary special version of your own inventory code. Or you can outsource it. Right? So now what you can do is you can say, I'm going to go to the cloud. But here's the problem. How do I get all my data to the cloud? Now is that another place that I have to send it to and worry about? So this idea of having a platform in the middle, single place to go to do that connectivity, Right? We see is actually being a, a requirement for this. Well, I did a presentation, this isn't just in manufacturing. I did a presentation uh, uh, a month ago at an IoT conference where I talked about uh, home automation. So the concept in home automation is as you bring new things into your home, they're going to actually, there's a group of folks, right? they're called the mesh network guys. And they're the folks who say, when I turn on this thing, it is going to connect to my Wi-Fi and then it will seek out every other thing in my house and it will automatically negotiate not only protocols but what it can do uh, with, that other, with that other thing. Now that's fine if I have three things in my house. What happens when I have 500 things in my house? What happens when every sensor at every door is actually its own autonomous thing? So am I really gonna be able to do this? Why can't I have a single place to go to manage all the things in my life? It's 10 times worse for a manufacturing organization, right? I want one place to go to know whether or not, right, exactly what is connected and what isn't connected, right? It certainly stops rogue things from getting into that, right? So you, you gotta start thinking about things, as, right, and machines as users, right? We talk about rogue users all the time. Why not rogue machines? So someone decides to bring a new machine into the plant and that machine basically decides to connect to all my other stuff. How do I provision it in and provision it up? This gets back to this whole idea, right, of an identity cloud, right? So again, right, I think we understand the concept of, of VANs, right, which is data connectivity. Single place for me to connect to for the purpose of being able to send and receive data from a plurality of systems that are external to me, right? Why wouldn't I do the same thing with identity, right? A single place to identify myself to be able to consume external systems, right? Now, in our 
private world, we would love this. So can you imagine a world where you had one ID and one credential that got you to every single thing that you needed to do for your private life? So your 401k side, everything. Now, we do it through things like LastPass, right? There's password uh, savers and there's things like that, right? But we all get the idea of how nice it would be to be able to go to one spot to authenticate. Well, it's going to be the same thing with machines. Machines are gonna to have to authenticate themselves for the purpose of being able to do things, right? So, so machines will have the ability, either they're sensors, meaning they're monitoring something and they need to send data someplace, right? Or they're, or they're actuators, meaning they are getting command signals from someplace externally for the purpose of doing something, or they're both. Right? Your vehicle's a good example of a boat, right? It is a sensor for the purpose of telling you when your bolt is, is charged or what your uh, tire pressure level is, right? And they're also an actuator from the standpoint of the fact that you can remote start them or, or remote unlock them. It's important for them to be identified as the right thing, right? I don't want my neighbor to be able to start my car in the same way he doesn't want that. I won't really care about his tire pressure. I want to know what my tire pressure is. Same thing in machines and manufacturing. Each one is going to have to authenticate itself, right, to be able to decide what it does. They're going to deal with triggers, right? So a single place to go where all the triggers go. So one system, right, so an HVAC system, for example, or an inventory system, Right, that's communicating to a logistics supplier may care about the inventory of 40, 50, 100 parts in order for that logistics supplier to be able to do five or six pickups on the way and be able to do those things. Right? And so multiple triggers all to one spot, but again, you may not want, supplier A may not want to be informed or you may not want to inform them of something that a competing supplier is doing. So this ability to know where the data is going and who is sending the information where it is becomes really important, right? Access management is just this idea of how do you know the thing is who the thing says it is. So again, right, we use IDs and passwords and you guys have moved on to two-factor using some sort of token. Maybe you guys get the SMS text message. By the way, I'd recommend if given the opportunity, you turn that on everywhere because passwords are almost by definition unbelievably hackable. Uh, and at least with two-factor, you have some capabilities. But why wouldn't machines be the same thing? Wouldn't it be great if I could impersonate your inventory system and tell every single one of your suppliers your inventory is full so that you get nothing shipped to you ever? Right? If a hacker wanted to take down some, right, there's easy ways to hack things. Everyone talks about hacking from a standpoint of I'm just going to steal data. Maybe all I really want to do is I want to shut a manufacturing system down. How do I do that? Well, just make sure that you never get any parts delivered because all of these automated signals are going to say, you know, you're cool, you're cool, everything is, everything is great. So, so those are the sorts of things, right, where we have to be able to identify. Identity life cycle, right? This is the idea of how do I disconnect some? So the connecting thing has to be easy, but no one ever thinks of the thing which is deprovisioning. So I have a whole bunch of automated uh, devices that are in my plant, and now I'm gonna go through a plant refit. And as we all know, right, manufacturers don't throw anything out. I've often kind of found that what it is is tier twos seem to be like the little brothers and sisters of tier ones. Right? The tier twos say I've got a bunch of stuff and I'm going to, the tier ones say I have a bunch of stuff and I'm going to give it to the tier twos and the tier twos give it to the tier threes, right? And they reuse this, this sort of thing. Well, if I, if I give a bunch of sensors, right, that I've set up to authenticate and identify themselves and I hand them to another and I sell them on the open market, I would rather they didn't connect to my stuff anymore. How, how do I disconnect them? How do I turn them off? from connecting to my inventory system, which by the way, I just moved into the cloud, so it's not even on my premises anymore, right? I would like that turned off. How do I deprovision a user, right? So think, you know, if you think about machines like people, it's the, you know, 
If I fire Bob, it would be nice if Bob couldn't continue to log into the finance system and cut himself checks. I'd like to turn him off from doing that. It's the same with machines, right? And then the idea of unlimited content integration, right? And that a lot is the, is the ability to say, I can deal with it as a machine. I can deal with something in one format. I need you to translate it to the format I can deal with without me having to worry about new technologies and new protocols and all those sorts of things. So as I said, I wanted to use an example of an industry that actually has done a fairly good job of doing uh, uh, some connectivity protocols, right? And um, I had to find something that was close at least to manufacturing, had a lot of the same sorts, sorts of things, right, but wasn't manufacturing. And if you take a look at the agriculture industry, that one doesn't work very, very well. If I looked at the healthcare industry, that doesn't work uh, uh, very well. Electronics industry is a little bit different, but the energy industry is unique because they have a lot of the same problems, right? And we've done some work with the energy industry. So if you think about, so in energy, right, they have this concept of upstream, midstream, and downstream. In upstream, what you're looking at is you're looking at things like exploration. So this is all of the stuff that would be engineering in the case of manufacturing. So in upstream, what I'm doing is I'm taking a look at seismic information. I'm deciding that I'm going to build a drilling rig, right, or rent a drilling rig, right? Or I'm going to, or I'm going to do something uh, on the land, so I'm going to have some sort of a pump jack or a rig that's on the land, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a set of drilling and monitoring. So they do a significant amount of drilling and monitoring. What's interesting about this is this exact thing here, maybe four or five separate companies. So the, the oil industry doesn't do anything alone anymore. So the drilling rig is probably actually owned by a company called Transocean. Transocean owns drilling rigs and the people who actually work on those rigs, but they're not the actual super major that's doing the drilling. They're just the folks who own and manage the rig, right? You can think of a rig a lot like a manufacturing plant, for example, right? The folks that do all the monitoring, the ones that are experts at determining if there's oil down there are companies like Schlumberger, right, or Halliburton, right, they're called field services companies. Right? Again, separate companies, separate employees, and then you've got the super major who is the one, right? so that's the Shells and the Chevrons and the BPs that are the ones who manage all of this and have to connect all of this stuff. Now, what's interesting about the, fact, the, the, the similarities between energy and manufacturing is the fact that in manufacturing we have this whole idea, right, right steel to wheel, right? So, so the idea that says I want to be able to shrink the amount of time from the time that I design a vehicle to the time I can get it out, right? So that if gas prices go way up, I can start getting out vehicles that are that are really good gas mileage. If gas prices go down, maybe I go back to my SUVs. So that ability to do that. In energy, it's called time to first oil, right? All they care about is reserves, right? How quickly can I decide whether there's any oil at the bottom of that hole? And how little money can I spend to be done with it? right, or to invest in it, right? So the ability for them to quickly communicate, right? The ability for them to know what's kind of at that bottom of the hole, right? So once they do this, so again, right? Manufacturing has this concept of tier two, tier one, oh yeah, <clears throat> right? Two tier, two, tier twos build a whole bunch of parts, the tier ones put them together into sub-assemblies, the OEMs, then assemble them basically into the, to the original vehicle. Right? Energy industry has the same, the same issue, right? So the idea is, I now have crude oil, right? Well, crude oil now needs to be either shipped or piped someplace so I can refine it, right? That's creating the subassembly, which, by the way, after refining, ends up getting shipped again until actually I get to sell it, right? So it's this ability of, a, of, of assembly, lots and lots of logistics, right? The fact that it is, right, when that ship, right, ends up leaving, for example, Saudi Arabia, and it's going to a refining station that sits in Houston, right? That can be a four and a half month trip, right? They have to have planned the refining that is in Houston four and a half months beforehand. It's a just-in-time kind of, 
kind of model. Interestingly enough, one of the things that, uh, that I learned uh, working with energy guys is uh, that ship, the uh, oil that is in there, may actually change hands four or five times while it's traveling, right? So they may actually repurchase and resell it based upon people's needs while it's moving. So lots and lots of communication. The same thing happens in a supply chain industry, right? So you start with raw steel, right? There is a shipment that has to occur, right? That steel then has to sit someplace. Then it has to be acted upon, right? By, by some sort of supplier, who by the way then inventories it again so that it can be shipped for the purpose of it being actually put on an end OEM vehicle so it can be shipped so that it can sit in inventory at a dealership so that somebody can buy the vehicle. So imagine in a perfect world, this idea where when a dealer sold a car, that act of selling the vehicle from his lot automatically propagated all the way back to the steel manufacturer to say, this is how much steel you actually have to manufacture in order to fulfill the need for us to keep inventory the same all the way across. So think of all the communications and companies that you have to focus on to do that. Now, in the old days, what we would do is we would do that with people. So the way it would be is the dealer would call his inventory rep saying, I, need to, I, I just sold five Malibus, I need five more Malibus, right? That guy would end up uh, uh, degradating the inventory that sat at General Motors, right? When that inventory went down, there was a guy that would communicate to the plant to say we need to up production for a certain amount. There'd be a whole bunch of guys on the plant floor who would physically look, right, at the inventory and go, I remember when pull systems were nothing more than a red line, right? And when the inventory got below the red line, that was the pull, right? And then they had a pull tag, right? That they would pull and that's the way inventory was done and it was people who did it, okay? We're getting to the point now where it is the, no, the shelf that the inventory is on knows exactly how many pieces are there. It orders its own parts. OEMs have gotten to the point where what they've done actually, and this, this happens even in grocery shops, but I know it happens uh, at General Motors, where they say to the supplier, so you see this section here? That's yours. Technically, that's not GM property. That's your property, and it's your responsibility to make sure that there are always enough parts there. And if you don't, then, then there's a bunch of clawbacks and, and things you have to do. I, I have removed myself from that responsibility. Right? So now what we're getting is more and more of this automated type of stuff, right? So it is triggers upon triggers upon triggers. And this is just for inventory, right? I'm not even talking about things like engineering changes, right? That get pushed down to a CNC machine because they found <coughs> something, right? Or what are you gonna do with scrap management? I mean, all of the things that now get connected, right? I know that there is a push among OEMs today to actually have lights out manufacturing facilities a facility where raw materials go in and out of them come vehicles, right? Now, that's, that's a lofty goal to have no one in it, but think about when that happens, right? And the machines are doing all of the stuff. How is it that you're going to make sure that they are all connected appropriately? And, you know, you know for those of us who have been in manufacturing long enough, it only takes one part. So, I remember when, uh, when an electronics uh, supplier uh, ended up getting, in Japan, uh, ended up uh, getting uh, flooded, and so there was a chip they could no longer manufacture, and it shut down a line at Delphi, which shut down five different vehicles at General Motors. All because some guy who, by the way, made a, the, probably the smallest piece that is in a vehicle, couldn't ship those parts, it stopped them from manufacturing vehicles. So everything has to work simultaneously, right? Nothing can fail, right? With just-in-time systems, we have no opportunity for them to fail, right? And the problem is some people think that the way to do this is everything will talk to everything. So I'm just gonna make it, right? These are the mesh network guys. I'm gonna make it so every single thing knows about every other thing and communicates with every other thing. Now, I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of challenges with that not the least of which is, is as a hacker, 
right? Every line is an opportunity for me to hack into something, right? And as I said, I only have to disrupt one thing. I don't have to disrupt it all. Just get rid of one, and you stop manufacturing, right? Again, we believe this idea of having a central place that manages all the rules. Everything connects centrally and then moves, right? Allows it, first off, it's a lot easier. You can move the security into the cloud, right? Because it is very difficult to update machines. It is very easy to update the cloud, right? Again, connected vehicles are a perfect example of this. When organizations find problems in connected vehicle, Right? If anyone here has ever tried to update Ford Sync, for example, it's a painful process. Why? Well, because normally when you're updating something, you can't use it, and nobody wants to sit in the thing while they're not using it. Right? Computers are easy. Right? You have this update. Fine, do the update. I'm going to bed. Right? No one's going to leave their car running while it's updating. And oh, by the way, while it's updating, you can't drive it. Right? So it becomes kind of a difficult process. So how do we get there, right? How do we get to the idea where we have intelligent loading bays, right? That track the trucks in transit, right? So I know exactly where the truck is, and oh, by the way, I know the traffic that is currently at 94, and so I know that although truck A was scheduled first and truck B was scheduled second, based upon the path that he's taking, the second truck is gonna come first, and that's what I'm gonna set up for, because I know where the truck is, I know what the traffic is, I know what the ETA is, right? Complex production sch schedules get laid out automatically. As, as things get more and more connected, right, the problem is